All right, so this is the second lecture of the three lectures covering the peripheral nerve lesions table on the last page of the hand section in your book. And in this lecture, we're going to be covering the second pair, the ulnar claw and the hand of benediction. Now, these two presentations look very similar visually, but they're actually, in reality, very different nerve lesions. And so we're going to go through each of them individually, and then at the end, we're going to compare them side by side and make sure you understand the clear differences between the two and, and that you can distinguish both of them. So moving on, distal ulnar nerve injury. This is the first and the, the next pair. So distal ulnar nerve means that it's essentially in the distal forearm or at the wrist. And so what we're getting at there is that it's more, you're going you're gonna to be more focused on the hand muscles and what they're doing. And so if you look at it even more zoomed in here, so here's the ulnar nerve indicated here. Here's your median nerve here. So here's your ulnar nerve coming in like this, and you can see where it really comes down. It has the deep branch here that swings down like this and innervates a number of these intrinsic hand muscles. So by having a lesion here that affects it distally, you really, as you can see, then you're really affecting any kind of distal innervation in the hand. And so really what you want to be thinking about is, is, that, is, is specifically these muscles innervated by the ulnar nerve and how that's going to give you the presentation you see. So the muscle deficits, the big, the big ones to be aware of here in a distal ulnar nerve injury is the third and fourth lumbricals. So the third and fourth lumbricals as you can see here on this Palmer uh, view here. So these, there's these muscles right here. This is ulnar nerve. First and second are median. And then the dorsal and Palmer interossei, like we talked about, these are also, also ulnar nerve as well. So these three sets of muscles are going to be affected. With the third and fourth lumbricals, it's going to be just like how we talked about clumpy claw, except the difference is with clumpy claw is that you had median and ulnar nerve involvement. This one you just have ulnar nerve, so it's only going to be these third and fourth. So in the fourth and fifth digit, you've lost MCP flexion, so that at that, at that joint the fingers will be extended. And then you've lost fourth and fifth digit PIP and DIP extension, because if you remember the lumbricals, they wrap around and they aid in extension of those two joints. Same thing with the dorsal and palmar interossei. These muscles as well, they do the same thing here. They assist with MCP flexion and PIP and DIP extension. So they essentially assist the, in addition to their main function of abduction and adduction respectively, they also assist with flexion of the MCP and then extension of the PIP and DIP joints. So these are going to be weaker as well. So the, their loss is going to be contributing to this as well. What's going to be normal is that you're going to have normal MCP extension really at all five digits because the entire the radial nerve is intact. The extensor compartment is going to be intact. The other thing here is that fourth and fifth digit PIP and DIP flexion will be intact because since it's a distal ulnar nerve injury, and again really only one flexor muscle is innervated by the ulnar nerve entirely, and then you have the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus, is, an, is innervated by ulnar nerve as well. And since it's a distal ulnar nerve injury, it means that, you know, really all the forearm muscles have received their innervation. And really, the, you know, even though the ulnar nerve only innervates essentially one and a half muscles in the forearm, the point is, is that you've, you're at distal, there's no chance of affecting forearm flexor muscles. So you're still going to have flexion at the PIP and DIP joints. So then that's where you get your signature sign. It really is a result of, the, of these right here is the ulnar claw. And so when the patient tries to extend, so in this case, the patient is very easily extending out digits two and three here with the help of the lumbricals. Now you remember these lumbricals here, lumbricals one and two are median nerve, okay? So that's why he's able to do that. That's why he's able to extend out this way. Now, if you notice, these fingers, they get stuck. They can't, they're not able to extend all the way out. They can't extend all four fingers out. And the reason for that is, is that they've lost the lumbricals, and that's what gives you this presentation here. Sure, they can extend at the MCP joint here. So they can extend here. Remember, they can't flex because they've lost lumbricals. They can extend here, but then they can't extend at the PIP or the DIP joints. So that's why you have these fingers where they're, they're kind of extended out like this, but then they, they're flexed at the PIP and DIP joints. So they're flexed in like this. They, they essentially, when the patient goes to extend their fingers, these two fingers get stuck. And it's because you've lost ulnar nerve and you've lost these third and fourth lumbricals. And then also contributing is losing the dorsal and palmar interossei. The other thing is that at, at rest, you could also see this as well, because if they're just letting it sit there, 
you're essentially relaxing your fingers, relaxing your hands, so your fingers are going to just lay out. So it's you know easy again for these fingers to just lay out. There's nothing restricting that. They're in muscle equilibrium. The equ equilibrium here, though, is offset because the flexors, the lumbricals in this case, are lost. And then you have the extensor muscles, again, the lumbricals, and then the interossei muscles are lost. And so they're not able to relax and extend out this way in a resting position. So that's, that's a big thing to note is that the ulnar claw is, is happens, especially when the patient tries to extend because, like I said, they essentially get stuck for these reasons here. The other thing to be aware of with ulnar nerve injuries is they can have atrophy of the hypothenar eminence. So here's the hypothenar, these muscles that move the, the small finger. Remember, this is the thenar eminence, the muscles that move the thumb. And so you want to be aware of that as well. That you can, if, if it's prolonged injury or pro prolonged impingement of the ulnar nerve and de-innervation of these muscles, they can get develop atrophy. And quickly, the sensory loss here, since this is an ulnar nerve injury, it's going to be an ulnar nerve distribution. So it's going to be in this blue part, part here on the palmar aspect. And then on the dorsal aspect as well here, it's going to be on these last one and a half fingers here, both on the palmar and dorsal aspect of the medial half of the hand. So the second in the pair here is the proximal median nerve injury. And so you really what you want to think about that, again, the big thing, reason why we say proximal is that it's not at the wrist and that it's here, more proximally here in the forearm. And the, and the whole idea here, again, is that you're affecting the forearm compartment muscles by saying that it's a proximal nerve injury. So what muscles are going to be affected, as you can probably guess by what I said, it's the forearm flexor compartment. So flexor digitorum superficialis, which again, you can see right here just below this, so you have this first layer of muscles, and then this is the second layer, the flexor digitorum superficialis. You can see these tendons coming out like this, and then they form these hood-like structures like this. So these are your flexor digitorum superficialis tendons coming into the fingers here. So the other thing you're going to lose is, is radial half of flexor digitorum profundus. So we see flexor digitorum profundus here. So you've essentially you've cut away the first two layers and now you're down to this deep muscle here. And you can see as it you know comes down into the hand and it fans out into these tendons that go all the way to the distal phalanges. They cross the DIP joints and flex the DIP joints. They travel, if you remember, underneath these uh, hoods from flexor digitorum superficialis. And so if you remember this muscle is essentially, you know, has two is cut in half innervation wise. So you have the lateral part here, which is where the, th the thumb is, and then you have the medial part here. The medial part is the ulnar nerves, and then you have the lateral half, or radial, because the radius is more lateral. The radial half is median nerve, and so since we have a proximal median nerve injury, this half of the muscle is going to be denervated. So the half of the muscle that goes on to flex the DIP joints at digits 1 and 2, those, those functions are going to be lost. So then next you have flexor pollicis longus, which is going to be lost. And flexor pollicis longus is a forearm muscle that acts at the thumb. Then you have the thenar eminence, which is shown here. So again, most the, you know, these are both thumb muscles that help with flexion of the thumb. And then you have the first and second lumbricals, which are shown right here. So you're going to have these. So really these first two digits are going to be affected. And we'll go through the presentation on the next slide. So because you've lost this half here at the DIP joint and then the PIP joint and then you've lost at the MCP joint because of the the lumbricals. So this is something we want to point out real quick here is that with any median nerve injury so not just proximal this could be also be a distal if you had it at the wrist here and loss of denervation to the thenar eminence essentially is that you're going to have loss of opposition and then that gives you a presentation what's called ape hand so where the thumb hangs out out here because if you remember a big thing that distinguishes us from apes is that we're able to oppose our thumb. And so that's where you, the, the terminology ape hand comes from, is this is kind of this thumb that hangs out here and it can't be brought in uh, in contact with the small finger. So you're not able to do this part. The other thing you can have is also atrophy of the thenar eminence. And remember, this is something you can see in like with really chronic carpal tunnel, where you have diminished innervation of the thenar eminence muscles, you can begin to see atrophy over time. So now the presentation you would see on physical exam as a result of these muscle deficits is, so flexor digitorum superficialis, this is median nerve, so it's going to be all, all four fingers will be affected, PIP flexion. The main ones we're going to really focus on are these two, the one and two, because 
Then you have the radial half of flexor digitorum profundus, like we explained. So the second and third digits, DIP flexion, are going to be affected. So that's at this point right here, DIP. Then flexor pollis is longest in the theonar eminence. That's what gives us that ape hand that we talked about and really impaired flexion of the thumb as well because of this FPL involvement. And then first and second lumbricals, so loss of second and third digits, MCP flexion. So essentially what you've lost here, if you really look at this, is, is in the first and second digits is you've lost flexion at all three of these joints, MCP, PIP, and DIP. So you've lost flexion at all of them because MCP, you've lost it because of the lumbricals. PIP, you've lost it because of the flexor digitorum superficialis. And then DIP, you've lost because of the radial half of flexor digitorum profundus. So that's why you see where these, these two fingers, they're completely extended out. There's no flexion going on here whatsoever. So what's normal is fourth and fifth digit MCP flexion because that's ulnar nerve. Those are the lumbrical, the third and fourth lumbricals, which are ulnar nerve. And then digits one through five MCP extension are okay. You still have the radial nerve intact. You have the extensor compartment intact. And then as a result of that as well, you also have extension at PIP and DIP uh, joints as well. Because it, I, even though the lumbricals will help with extension at those joints, you also, can, you also get a big contribution to extension at those joints as a result of the extensor compartment muscles as well. And so even though you've lost lumbricals, you it's not like you've lost that motion entirely. You still have the extensor compartment doing extension of these joints as well. And so that's what gives you this signature sign, which is the famous hand of benediction or the Pope's blessing because of the way the, look, the hand looks. And this is when making a fist. So right here, this patient is trying to make a fist. So these two fingers are okay. The lumbricals are intact, and then the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus is intact. So they're able to flex this, these two fingers all the way in like this. And then the reason why you see the thumb hanging out like this is because you've lost flexor pauses longest in the thenar eminence. So you have kind of this ape hand shape combined with a hand of benediction. And so you have this thumb kind of hanging out like this. They're not able to bring, because when you, you know, you, a fist, you would bring all your fingers together, including your thumb. They're not able to do that. And then lastly, the big ones here is you've lost flexion at all three of these joints. You can't flex at any of these, at MCP, PIP, or the DIP. And so that's why when they go to flex, these fingers essentially, like we were talking about earlier, they, in a different presentation, they get stuck. They can't move any longer. Sure, when you extend the all four out, it'll look okay, but then when you go to bring it back, only these fingers can come in when you're trying to make that fist. And that's what give it. So that's the key thing is this is this is not necessarily at ri at rest. I wouldn't say this this one ha this doesn't happen at rest. This happens when you, if you were on exam, you were to ask a patient to make a fist. This is what their hand would look like. And the sensory loss for this patient, since again it's a median nerve injury, it's going to be in the median nerve distribution. So it's going to be in this red part here. So the first three and a half fingers on the palmar aspect, and then also the tips of the fingers here as well on the dorsal aspect. So our, our second pair here, now this is a really key one because this is where people really get tripped up because you can see on just a general view of both of these hands, they look pretty similar, but really they're, they're definitely not the same presentation and we want to go over the differences between the two lesions and why the presentations are different. So you have a distal ulnar nerve injury, which is going to happen here, and then you have a proximal median nerve injury, which is going to happen more so up here. So first, distal ulnar nerve injury. You're going to have loss of lumbricals 3 and 4 versus loss of lumbricals 1 and 2 in a proximal median nerve injury. So these lumbricals are gone here, these guys are gone here, and then these guys are gone here. So as you can see here, already a major difference here, and this is probably the most important difference. The other very significant difference, and this is why it makes such a big deal about if it's proximal or distal, meaning is it at the wrist or more proximal in the forearm, is that since this is a distal injury and it's happening down here at the wrist, you've already innervated, and essentially also because median nerve isn't affected, is you've already innervated the flexor compartment of the forearm. So the forearm flexor muscles are intact. So since those are intact, you're going to have flex, you're going to have okay flexion of the PIP plus the DIP joints. Versus here, because it's a median nerve injury and because it's proximal, that wouldn't be the case if it was distal. If it was a distal median nerve injury, 
by this time you by this point you've already innervated the flexor compartment and so it'd still be intact but the difference here is we're talking about a proximal median nerve injury which is happening up here so you're cutting off innervation both to the median nerve innervation in the hand but also in the forearm so you've lost forearm flexor muscles so these are really the, these are really two key differences here in this in, when differentiating these two because this is a very common confusion point for when people are first learning this is that you know these look the same how do I differentiate them and the big thing is that you got to understand that it's they're two different nerves two different positions distal versus proximal median and ulnar nerve and so you have loss of lumbricals one and two in this one and then you have also loss of the flexor muscles of the of the forearm that's why these fingers are extended all the way out there's no flexion at any of these three joints so your MCPs your PIP and then your DIP completely gone versus these guys are okay they can come in and flex in so I should clarify is that loss of flexor muscles for these two fingers specifically you still have flexor digitorum profundus is still intact for these as well and that's why you can see this flexion here and so as a result of that that's why this occurs when making a fist because when you're making a fist you're essentially you're flexing your fingers and so the fact that you've lost these forearm muscles that's where this presentation is going to show because the fact that you've lost your forearm muscles and you've uh, combined with losing the lumbricals then you've lost flexion of all these fingers and then that's where it's going to show up versus this one this occurs when you're doing the opposite you're extending the fingers out so by losing lumbricals three and four and then also by losing essentially you're also losing the inner osseous muscle you're losing extension here at these at these DIP and PIP joints okay so that's why you see them curled up like this is again they're getting stuck they can't they cannot extend out so you're at this person is trying to extend all four fingers out and they can't do it so that's really the big difference is I, again I want to just drive this home that these are really the three major differences is that it's lumbricals three and four here because it's ulnar nerve it's lumbricals one and two here because it's median nerve the, the forearm flexor muscles are entirely intact because median nerve is not affected and then also the two the one and a half muscles that would be ulnar nerve are still intact because it's a distal injury so those muscles have already received their innervation these occur when you're extending the fingers out versus when you're trying to flex the fingers to make a fist and then as a result of that you have loss of forearm and loss of lumbricals one and two and so that's why you see that with that all right, so that's the ulnar claw and the hand of benediction. And then in the next lecture, we're going to cover the median claw and the okay gesture.